Hi, I'm Celeste. Hi, I'm Richard. Hey, I'm Christy. And I'm Tally. We're the hosts of Unethical Podcast. Every episode, we take a humorous dive into a case study that poses an ethical question. Like, should mentally ill murderers ever be released? No. When a victim consents to die, is it still a murder? Yep. And does someone telling someone to kill themselves make you culpable if they do? Nah. We discuss what the outcomes of these cases are and what they should be with a unique guest host every episode, assuming someone is brave enough to join us. Richard needs some more testosterone around here. Nah, I think it's mostly coming from Celeste. Girls are mean. We will also explore the supernatural, the theoretical, and the conspiratorial. We'll talk about what's underground, what's above the sky, what's hiding in the dark, and what makes you see the light. What about what's in your closet? I want to believe. God damn, I love Dana Scully. You need a minute? Are you guys watching? Because that helps. I wish I was a tree. But when does a fun story become a dangerous influence? When is fiction actually fact? The last time I checked, those words meant the opposite. It doesn't matter. Our podcast is no holds barred, true crime, comedy, adult content, and definitely not for everybody. Uh, but like most people, most people aren't like can handle swear words and stuff, right? Am I right about that? No. No. But if you, like us, have trauma-fueled coping mechanisms, join us each week and visit a destination you can't unvisit. The dark side. You can subscribe wherever you eat your podcasts to listen. Follow us on Instagram where we post our teasers to guess what's coming next. And join us on Facebook to get involved in the conversation. Welcome to Unethical Podcast. Warning, this podcast contains themes of extreme violence and murder. Subject matter may be offensive to some listeners. Discretion advised. Welcome to another episode of Evil Transgression, your homicide headquarters here in podcasting. I'm Josh, and with me as always, Dustin and Rex. Hey, what's going on? Hey, what's up? Hey, what's going on? Hey, hey. I can tell you what's going on. You, okay. Are you still doing it? I bought a truck. <laughs> oh my goodness, it happened. <laughs> it, I'm so proud of you. I did. You're all grown up now. Yep. Mm. So are you happy with it? I am. You should be until everybody's like, "Hey, I gotta get this, pick up this couch." I know. Busy on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like we talked earlier, you're gonna come over and help me uh, clean out my garage. Yeah, see, I already have a job. <laughs> <laughs> I already got a job. That's why I'm buying a smart car. The next time. <laughs> like, hey, can you hold this? Nope, can't. Can't, right. fit, what, can't even um, fit a bag of groceries in this bad boy. <laughs> Dude, what's that super? Is it a Scion IQ? Is that what they call it? There are the and the ends? yeah the Toyota Yaris as well, yeah. where it felt like the rear end was always yeah. swerving on you. That's what I'm gonna get. I think you I'm lo- I think I'm taller than what that car is long. It's a small <laughs> car. It is. It is. I was gonna buy Drew one of those when he turned 16. One of those Yaris's just so I can oh, laugh. Yeah. <laughs> like a laugh when he pulled in the drive. Like <laughs> it looks like whenever you go see like a clown in a car, you know they're like way too big for the car. Uh huh. Hey, so, uh, how was your week? It was a week. It was. Mm-hmm. I worked 70 some hours, man. <laughs> God, I need a vacation. <laughs> uh, you know what? <laughs> oh, man. I haven't had a vacation in like five years. <laughs> that yeah, sucks. Well, take one. I should. But then, quit being Mr. Important then, in your job. Uh, then right. my job would collapse, and I'd come back, and they'd be like, "Hey, you're unemployed." And I'm like, "There's the last vacation I'm taking." <laughs> <laughs> Guess we we're eating ramen noodles for the rest of the year. Hey, nothing wrong with top ramen. Oh, those are good. The beef teriyaki top ramen. Yep. Yeah, but, but it's different than regular ramen. 
I like chicken. I like the spicy ones. So this I'm is a food hungry. podcast. Now. Yes. This yes. is a top ramen podcast. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough. Uh, we are about to go back to the Great Depression. Ooh, this episode. I'm depressed already just yeah, thinking about yeah, it. Me I know. I know. So, what year was the Great Depression, Dustin? What, was, what year did the stock market crash? 1929. You Ooh. only know that because we told you. Earlier. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, the Great Depression was from 29 um, into the early 30s. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, let's get depressed together. <laughs> <laughs> so buckle up, evil mob, as we discuss a fellow by the name of Charles Mackley. Charles Mackley was born in St. Mary's, Ohio on November 24th, 1889. Hey, I used to go fishing up there when I was a kid. Me, Saint, me and my daddy. St. Mary's, Ohio? St. Mary's Lake. Ooh. Don't even know where that is. <laughs> Uh, I'd say it's north of Dayton. What, maybe a couple hours? Yeah. About that. Yeah. His parents, Edward Mackley and Martha Sunderland Mackley, gave uh, gave him life. Mm. If I can say that. I like the way you phrased that. It was nice. Charles was the oldest of five children. Charles would drop out of school in the eighth grade, just like Dustin, and begin his <laughs> criminal career. <laughs> By the time Charles was a teenager, he had already been arrested for petty theft, bootlegging, and bank robbery. Dang. Bootlegging. Oh, that's what I'd want to be. I want to be a bootlegger. <laughs> What's a bootlegger do? Uh, don't they like... Uh, like sell like <laughs> illegal shit, like make illegal. I don't stuff. know, but I want to yeah. do it. Yeah. Like I you can bootleg liquor. I just want to like, like I, if back then I would just want to like have that title. Like, look at him; he's a famous bootlegger. <laughs> Dustin <laughs> is a bootlegger. <laughs> Works out of Chicago. <laughs> bootlegger. Uh, so I mean, he's already going down like a gangster uh, path. Sounds like it, right? But when I say gangster. I mean a real gangster. Yes. I don't mean like uh, now modern day gangsters. Mm-hmm. Fucking gangster. Yeah. Right? The the real gangsters. The ones in the suits. Yeah. That's I mean, that's where it's at. The it gangsters is. always well dressed, nice mm-hmm. cars. Yeah. That a hey, that's a gangster. Right. You didn't see their buttholes. Because <laughs> their pants are always sagging. <laughs> Why are you always looking down there? I'm just saying it's. Oh, it is okay. true though. Like I saw, I saw a young man the other day, um, walking down the street, and he had his shirt lifted up. And he had uh, another thing I don't understand is why do you wear like eight pairs of uh, of, of pants if you're going to wear. <laughs> You know, if you're not going to wear them up covering your butthole. (laughs) So why do you have, like, uh, your underwear, two pairs of shorts, and then these jeans that... uh, Are down at your knees. Yeah, or Mm -hmm. mid-thigh. Yeah. Like, what's the point of that? Like, you would probably be more comfortable if you just wore one pair of shorts and actually, like, wore them at your waist. Right. You wouldn't need all that. They look like a penguin when they walk. (laughs) But, uh, yeah. I mean, it was... Butthole, butthole out. <laughs> right. Free, f- free flow. Maybe he was letting it air out some. You well, don't know. Sometimes yeah. you gotta let it, yeah. let it air out. Sweat, I guess. Sweaty day. <laughs> this, this gentleman is not one of those butthole <laughs> showers. <laughs> Charles's father Edward was a stone cutter, and when Charles was in his twenties, he would follow in his father's footsteps. Charles kept himself out of trouble for quite some time after landing a job with his father. On November 21st, 1921, Charles was arrested for receiving stolen property, but was later found not guilty. So you thought he was going to be a bad guy? Not a bad guy. But he's going to be a bad guy. (laughs) Over the next three years, Charles was arrested numerous times for different crimes. On July 30th, 1924, Charles was arrested for bank robbery in Wichita, Kansas, and was sentenced to 15 years in prison. But just like our lovely justice system always does, they paroled him after serving only four years. Of course they did. Don't you worry, though. 
Two days after being released, Charles robbed a bank in Hammond, Indiana, and was given a 10 to 20 year sentence. Mm. Dude's a rambling man. Well, I'm sure he's going to serve all that time because they let him out early, right? Probably not. On June 25th, 1928, Charles was transferred to the Indiana State Prison in Michigan City. That's a confusing geography for you. Oh, yeah, it is. Indiana State Prison in Michigan City. Mm Mm-hmm. Huh. So, uh, during research, I found this pretty interesting. At the time, Charles was in the Indiana State Prison. They had a silent system in place, meaning while the prisoners ate their meals and worked, they were not allowed to speak. Really? Like, you can't talk till you get back to your cell at the end of the day. Yeah. Mm. Like, don't talk to your friends. <laughs> we got in trouble at school once, and they was like, don't talk, ever. You think they walked around like mimes? That was me and you in, in class all the time. Oh, yeah. Like, you two can't talk, <laughs> ever. We found ways. Yeah. My guess is it was, I mean, some of that would be a boring place to work, though. Being mm. a guard at a place where nobody yeah. can talk. Right. Uh, well... I think that was a little bit of a different situation for a guard. They're probably like, hey, now I know if something's getting right to happen or these guys can't communicate to start something crazy and I got to jump in the middle of it. Right, right. But it would suck to be a prisoner there. Uh-huh. <laughs> like you, The only time you get to see your buddies, <laughs> you ain't allowed to talk. You just be like, <laughs> shut up and eat your mashed potatoes. <laughs> so during his time in prison, Charles was no role model, but he also wasn't a huge troublemaker. He was written up for small things, such as being caught with a cigarette, uh, cigarette rolling papers, and being caught with uh, an electric stove. Like, <laughs> <That's too laughs> what? <laughs> How you get caught with an electric stove, I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming they're talking like more, more towards like a lighter. Or Probably something. those little, like, you know, those little things. Yeah, like camping, yeah. camping stoves. Oh, That's yeah. my guess. Yeah. Not like an actual <laughs> stove. When by itself, he's got a, he's got a freaking electric <laughs> cook stove in there, <laughs> cooking a turkey in itself. <laughs> Also, while in prison, Charles became fast friends with a gentleman by the name of John Dillinger. Ooh. Ooh. Little famous mobster for you there. A little bit. For those of you who don't know who John Dillinger is, please stick your head in the door jam and shut the door. <laughs> uh, he was a famous bank robber during the Great Depression and was the leader of the Dillinger gang. I encourage you all to uh, do some research on him later. Very interesting man. Right. John Dillinger was paroled in 1933 and vowed to come back and break Charles out of prison. Oh, that's sweet. So they must have been pretty good friends. Sounds like it. So with this being the 30s, um, apparently uh, prison systems weren't that smart because Dillinger was able to smuggle guns in for Charles and a few others to help with their escape. Mm, That's impressive. And the way that Dillinger was able to get the guns in the prison was he put them in a crate full of thread and the crate was delivered to the shirt shop inside the prison. Mm. So no guards were like, let me see inside that. That's an awful heavy box of thread. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Must be some heavy duty cotton. (laughs) On September 26, 1933, Charles and 10 other men all armed made their escape from the Indiana State Prison. After escaping, the men immediately split into two groups. Four of the men hijacked the car at gunpoint from a sheriff that was transferring another prisoner to the jail in Michigan City. Mm. The balls that takes to steal a car from a sheriff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just roll up on a cop. Give me old car, <laughs> yeah. Get right. out, old man. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Charles and his partner, Harry Pierpont, went straight to Mary Kinder's house. This is the girlfriend of Harry. Once there, the two changed clothes and hung out in a barn owned by Mary's parents in Lepsic, Ohio. Lepsic, Ohio is just west of Finley and north of Lima. So if you're looking at a map, pow, there it is. Boom. After hanging out for a few days and trying to get the heat off of them, after their escape, it was learned that John Dillinger had been arrested and was being held at the Lima County Jail. So what do you do when you are a wanted man and you're trying not to get caught? 
you go rob a bank. (laughs) (laughs) Makes sense. On October 3rd, Charles and his gang robbed the first national bank in St. Mary, Ohio. This was to acquire money for the eventual prison break of none other than John Dillinger. My my thing is, these dudes are literally all around Ohio, Indiana. Like, yeah, they just keep going back and forth, back Mm -hmm. and forth. Like, I don't know. They're the real deal, though. Like, John Dillinger's the man during this time. It was. On October 12th, Charles and his gang made their way to the Lima County Jail where John Dillinger was being held. Once inside, Charles and Pierpont confronted Sheriff Jesse Sarber, who was standing with Deputy Wilbur Sharp and the Sheriff Jesse Sarber's wife. Charles and uh, Pierpont told the three that they were with the Indiana State Prison and were there for Dillinger to transfer him back to Indiana. I mean... That's a hell of a plan. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> we're just going to go in there and tell them we're here to transfer him back. <laughs> Sheriff Sarber questioned the two and asked for credentials. At the, that point, Pierpont pulled out his gun and shot Sheriff Sarber in the stomach. I mean, that makes sense. He's like, hey, let's see your credentials. You're like, here it is, pal. <laughs> After shooting the sheriff... Charles and uh, Pierpont then beat Sarber and locked Deputy Sharp and uh, Sarber's wife in a cell and then went and freed John Dillinger. That's a lot of names that start with us. (laughs) Yes. So they're leaving Sheriff Sarber to die. Mm. Say that that was real fast. Sheriff (laughs) Sarber. Sarber. (laughs) On October 14th, Charles and John Dillinger robbed a police station. Again, the balls these guys have and the total disregard for the police uh, where uh, they stole guns, ammunition, and bulletproof vests. Wow. They're like, let's rob a police station. There'll be no cops ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but they were able to do it. Yes. On October 20th, the two did the same thing, once again, robbing a police station in Peru, Indiana. Once again, there's a little bit of geography for you. Mm-hmm. Peru, Indiana. Yep. Which side of the world are we on? Hey, what about, uh, what was that Beach Boys song, Kokomo? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that in Indiana? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Maybe Kokomo, that, Indiana. Maybe when I was writing that up, maybe it was supposed to be Peru, India. <laughs> what? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, with an endless amount of guns and ammo, the two were ready for the big time. On October 23rd, Charles and Dillinger robbed a bank in Greencastle, Indiana, where they escaped with $74,782. That's a huge amount of money for the 30s. Keep in mind, oh, yeah. the Great Depression. That is a lot of money. Later that year, Charles was ranked number four on Indiana's list of public enemies, just behind Dillinger and uh, Pierpont. On January 25th, 1934, Charles and his gang were hiding out in Tucson, Arizona, when the hotel they were staying in caught fire. After the fire was put out, Charles tried to bribe the firefighters to go inside and grab a few briefcases they had in their room that were full of guns and money. So, hey, uh... Hey, uh, can you do us a favor? <laughs> like, I know, uh, I know you're here fighting that fire and all, but uh, there's a couple briefcases in our room, uh, room two fourteen. Uh, if you can just swing in there and grab a couple of them for you, we'll give you thirty dollars. <laughs> a few days later, that firefighter who uh, Charles had tried to bribe identified him from a mugshot, and a short time later, Charles was apprehended at Crabtree Electric Company while trying to buy himself a radio and using the alias J.C. Davies. Kind of a badass name, if you ask me. Yeah. Is it not? What's up, J.C. Davies? Davies. Uh, Yeah, I'm here to buy a radio. Name's J.C. Davies. (laughs) (laughs) Pierpont and Dillinger were arrested a short time later. Snitches get stitches. (laughs) True. Charles and Pierpont were sent back to the Indiana State Prison, where they were handed over to Sheriff Don Sarber, the son of Sheriff Jesse Sarber, mm, the man dude. that Charles and Pierpont had killed just a few months prior. It's pretty how, crazy. How crazy is that? Yeah. You know, that was not an easy booking. No. <laughs> no. 
Imagine how bad that would suck to be under the control of the man whose dad you just killed. Oh, yeah. In March of 1934, Charles and Pierpont stood trial for the murder of Jesse Sarber. They were both found guilty and sentenced to death. On March 27th, the pair was transferred to the Ohio State Prison in Columbus, Ohio. After spending a few months in prison and waiting for their date with old Sparky, Charles and Pierpont decided they were going to carve bars of soap to resemble revolvers, which is actually pretty cool, and paint them with black shoe polish. Mm. They made fake guns. Yeah. Wow. There must be one big ass bar of soap. <laughs> 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 On September 22nd, 1934, the two would use those fake guns to try and escape. They assaulted a guard and tried to free another inmate. While doing so, they alerted other guards. Charles and Pierpont took off running with the other guards behind them. Charles was shot in the stomach and died at the scene, while Pierpont was shot but later recovered from his wounds. Pierpont would be executed a few years later for his role in the murder of Sheriff Sarber. Charles Mackley is buried at the Sugar Ridge Cemetery in Lipsick, Ohio. I know you're all wanting to know what happened to the man named John Dillinger. Mm -hmm. Dillinger was shot and killed by federal agents in Chicago while attending a movie premiere. He was only 31 years old. But if you're one of the most wanted men, men's, (laughs) <laughs> you don't go to a movie premiere. It's no. in Chicago. Right. You're like, hey, uh, I know everybody's looking for me, but here I am. <laughs> right, yeah. But he was that kind of a uh, badass that he's like, eh? mm-hmm. he, he really was like a bad dude. Like, they're saying he even got like plastic surgery, tried to change his face. Oh, yeah. He was just, he was wild. Mm hmm. I mean, most of those gangsters during that era was Capone, Dillinger. Uh, Lucky Luciano. Yeah. I mean, those are some <laughs> yeah. crazy dudes. They are. Yeah. You didn't cross them either. Like, no. no. Those were not dudes that you didn't that you crossed. Right. Well, I was I was just reading a thing the other day about John Gotti. Uh, one somebody his the person that was behind him. Totally, John Gotti was not in the great. No, 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 no. It's a little bit. It's a little bit newer, but <laughs> he was probably one of the last of the the, the real ones. The real. Yeah. But I the, mean, there's still some out there, but Gotti's the last of the famous, I would say. Right. But the guy that lived behind him was driving down the street and hit his son and killed him. Yeah. And the, that yeah, dude, that guy's in a field yeah, under like, a concrete pad. He, like, came mm-hmm. up missing. I'm like, holy yeah. shit. Yeah. And he, like, apologized to him. I was like, I'm so Doesn't sorry. Matter. Right. And you I, cross Gotti. You're, you're done you're gone. Yeah. <laughs> you're gone. Yeah, he's, he's in a field somewhere under a concrete pad. Like... <laughs> Hey, what's that concrete pad doing in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> uh, Gotti poured it. Oh, okay. Better not mess with that. Yeah, they were wild. Yeah, I mean, but you don't see much of that anymore. You see, no. I mean, there's just idiot killings now. Right. I mean, there is still, I will say, there still is organized crime, but you don't have those famous ones. No, I think the one, the, didn't the one not that long ago just get killed over in New York? Yeah. He was like pulled up in front of his house and like they he was a, a crime what, what family was he a crime boss of? I forget which one it was. That would be the Gambino crime family. Yep. Yeah. He was just killed not that long ago. The good old Gambinos. They all have cool names too. They do. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And go over to old Gambino's house and uh, <laughs> lay down the firearms. <laughs> Good stuff. We grew up in the wrong era. We did. Yeah, yeah. we did. I mean, we we talk enough about it on the show. We we should be from another era. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't understand us, and we'd probably be the first ones taken out. <laughs> <laughs> that is the story of the Great Depression gangsters. And once again, I encourage all of you to check out John Dillinger and... Uh, Charles Mackley. Oh, yeah. They both lived some pretty interesting lives. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you... Did, did you guys ever watch The Sopranos? Oh, for sure. No, I didn't. You're kidding. Failure. You are kidding me. No, I didn't. One of the greatest shows of all time. Very great. You didn't watch The Sopranos? 
again, no. Loser. <laughs> If uh, you would like to help host this podcast, we are taking the application. I got, you've got to check it out. you got to watch The Sopranos. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, it's awesome. If I was a gangster, that's how I'd handle stuff uh-huh. like Tony like Tony did. Oh, yeah. Like, Tony Soprano was the man. He was awesome. <laughs> he had Crazy Uncle Junior. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. If you haven't watched The Sopranos. I heard the out. ending was shit. There was a couple. Uh, see, they switch writers. And a yeah. couple of the seasons, and you can tell there are some pretty crap seasons where you're like, "What is going on?" Mm-hmm. The ending, um, the ending was weird, and I think the reason they did it was kind of like an f you to HBO. Like, you know, HBO wanted to end a certain way, and the writers didn't want to end it that way. Yeah, kind of like turned into like a big f you. But uh, I'm not going to tell you how it ends. But right. It's one of those things that leaves you kind of hanging. Like, yeah, you're what? like, what just happened? What is going on? Yeah. First season's probably one of the greatest first seasons of any shows. Yeah. I mean, it's just, those guys don't play. No, they Like, don't. for example, um, uh, I don't know if you remember Polly. Oh, yeah. The the, uh, the guy that, uh, the landscaping guys that cut down the trees and stuff uh-huh. were messing with his business. Like, his, he, you know, he was getting money from the garbage company and uh-huh. stuff. They were messing with his business, and he goes over to talk to him, and the guy's up in the tree. He's like, yeah, you know, F you, blah, blah, blah. Polly yanks him out of the tree. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, man, I'll have to go back and watch that again. Yeah. They don't play around, man. No. That's, that, that's how, if I was a gangster, that's how I'd be. Just right. Like, oh, that's how it's going to be. I'm going to yank you out of a tree while you're <laughs> with a chainsaw. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. What you got for me, Rex? All right, the usual, go to our Facebook page, give us a like. Uh, If you have any uh, comments, questions, ideas, you can email us at eviltransgression at gmail.com. Dustin, I will not take your part this week, so take it over. (laughs) You can go to eviltransgression.com and check out our Patreon, um, our blogs, our store. Like We have a lot of links on there. Also, review, 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 review. On any any, uh, platform that you listen to. Mm -hmm. Right, so just review any... Anywhere you can review, review. Unless you're going to leave a bad review. Then go to somebody else's <laughs> podcast and leave a bad review. That's right. Yep. Just leave us love. Like, you guys are the greatest thing since sliced bread. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, I strongly want to second the... Uh, visit eviltransgression.com. Yeah. Tell us what you think needs to be added to eviltransgression.com. Right. Yep, and we'll still. try. We'll try and fit it on there, unless it's something ridiculous. Yeah, it's yeah. still a baby, so it, it is just an. It's a little infant. So little, and, uh, so little and cute. It's coddled up. <laughs> it's coddled up beautifulness. <laughs> Don't give me that look. He's it's probably hungry. I think that it's that's hungry. why he's giving it's the look. It's hungry yeah. time. Is your belly growling? It is. No, Rawr. Rawr. That's what you hear. Rawr. <laughs> belly's growling. <laughs> uh, All right. Ready to get out of here? Yeah. Now I want to stay here forever. <laughs> Go ahead. Move on with Rex. I want to okay. stay here forever. All right. This is weird. <laughs> <laughs> All right, evil mob. Until next week. See ya. See ya. Peace. <laughs>